Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, so excited to be joined by Shane Berger of Woods Bagot in a conversation about how to increase the impact of digital culture. Shane is an internationally recognized leader in the advanced use of technology and design and user experience for the built environment. As a principal of Woods Bagot, Shane directs the vision-centered on technical innovation and leads a global design ops team, the term that we're gonna be talking about a lot today, uh, dedicated to researching, developing, and applying new models of design and delivery to projects. He has lectured widely on a range of topics, including design computation, BIM, digital fabrication, building performance, VR, AR, smart buildings, and digital culture and experience. And with that, love to uh, welcome Shane to the to the show and also our, our as always uh chris morgan from the monograph team thanks shane for joining us hey there it's nice to see you cool so i think it's a good place to start um with your perspective on practice today um i'd love to g get your you know someone that's uh been in industry for a while tracking changes and especially sort of on on the forefront of those changes always looking towards like what's upcoming what are the things that you've noticed are interesting evolutions in the past kind of uh five years even um that are probably pointing to where like the next five to ten years are going to go yeah i you know it, it might be helpful to give a little bit of perspective about where i came from where i started off with um I was one of those many kind of computation people during the 2000s into early 2010s who kind of was brought in on a regular basis as like a hired gun. Um, I helped them get things across the line. I helped win competitions. I helped things get fixed. Um, if there was a bit of complex geometry to get figured out because they weren't sure it was going to get built, I jumped in to do that. Um, and for me, what it started to develop was a perspective that we needed to be in a position where we we're always looking for better ways to deliver our work, um, that the tools that were handed to us, the processes that we had, in some cases, the cultures that we had, were not conducive to delivering work as we progressed into a more digital-based future and, and what the clients and the market was actually demanding. Um, and what it started to do for me is it started to put me in to a perspective of where I um, started to better understand the context of which design technology operates, um, the kind of relationships, the connectedness, the processes, the patterns of all the systems at which we operate. So what I think is really quite interesting that's, that I've started to see in a number of firms and even some of the startups out, happening out there in the market are moving beyond that sort of computation mindset as applied to purely geometry and maybe analysis. And there's definitely that there. But they're really starting to tackle some of the problems around process, people, and culture, which I think is much more interesting um, and is where we need to be spending our time. So they're not just handing you a plugin and this plugin is going to make this easier for you to do. That, you know, that, that's very much early days, in some cases, still the current of what you see within Grasshopper and Dynamo and others. But they're starting to think about how new process models might then even lead to new business models. And that's where I'm starting to think about what the hype bars and the others of the world are doing in that space. Test fit everybody else about some new services and new ways of thinking. And then how that starts to manipulate then how a firm is structured. Now, I think one of the things that worries me a little bit is that we, we're sitting in a spot within, I think, the architecture industry where I think we have two, two big things that stand out for me as, as issues that worry me, things that I've not seen quite catch up over the last five years, even though that train's coming, or in some cases it's going. Um, and one is more short term, one is more mid to long term. And, and the, the first one that I've seen that's happened out there, and in the, my perspective, is that practice is um, at risk from an operational perspective, because we are unable to properly leverage our talent. We're not investing in our talent the way that we necessarily should be. Um, we're not looking for opportunities to automate commodity driven tasks in order to open up opportunities for non commodity driven tasks. Um, we're not leveraging the data that we have. We're not treating, we're still, there's still um, an, a significant aspect of the industry that is still treating um, technology as a necessary evil, but the core business has not changed. Um, 
what you need to do and what we've been doing at was and I've seen other firms do similar starting to treat it much more as a strategic asset. And that's where you start getting into questions about how can the data you generate both in the model as well as how you approach the work in all the way to timesheets and skills and all that stuff, how that can be leveraged to get you into either predictive analytics or better operational models, how you run your company and what are the, 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 um, the downstream benefits of that data. So that's the first one is thinking about operational issues that we run into, because I don't think we've really modernized the operations of a standard architecture of practice. Um, and that, if you don't do that, we're gonna be increasingly at risk, risk from some of the more vertically integrated companies that are able to take advantage of those efficiencies that we don't have. Because we're already inefficient with how we collaborate with others. If we're also inefficient with how we work internally, it's, a, it's gonna to continue to be an issue. So that's the more short-term issue. The longer-term issue though, is I think um, we, we're slow to recognize the, uh, the fact that our product is changing and it needs to change. And when I'm talking product, I'm still arguably talking about the design of experience for the built environment, all right? And, and I'm not being very specific in saying that that's a building or a room. Um, and I'm not saying that that is necessarily uh, purely non-digital items. I, I think what we need to start understanding is that our product is ultimately changing, how we procure our product, how we, what the actual product and the experience that people in the space actually is gonna be is changing. And we're not modernizing our thinking to that. There are so many spaces, architects with our understanding of how you know, people work socially and productively, how communities work, um, how people understand experience space as an individual and as, a, as an aggregate, all that stuff that could come to really affect our industry. Um, and we're, we're just letting others take over that sort of space. So my, my overall perspective is that there's some really interesting stuff that's going on. And I'm really enjoying seeing some more doc democratization around things like computation and other topics. But we're still we're still missing some issues that are going to cause us some near term problems and potentially more long term existential problems. It's a long answer, love, but there. yeah, I'd love to get into the internal side in a moment, but I want to first touch on a little bit of the external changes you're seeing in, in terms of how the economy is reorganizing around delivering the built environment. Um, as you described, like there are these vertically integrated uh, offerings that are kind of leaping over the inefficient, the internal inefficiencies of firms. But how are you seeing the product shifting maybe outside of the architectural services industry? And once abstracted, the other, you know, what might be working partners or may come to be uh, competitors in organizing and structuring the next version of the built environment? That's a good question. Um, I, I've heard I've heard the kind of I don't know exactly what the figure is. Just something like ninety to ninety five percent of what's built, at least in North America, is not built by a traditional architecture firm. You know, significant amounts of the built environment that we have no, nothing to do with or very little to do with. Um, maybe some design trends that we develop will show up in those buildings five to ten years from now but it's not it's not an area that we're in because a lot of it ends up being very repetitive um so we in the end it kind of feels like we're all fighting over the same five percent again maybe it's two percent i don't remember exactly what the figure is but we're all fighting over the same kind of smaller percentage of that um it's going to increasingly get to a point though where that um the the inefficiencies that i talked about that are seen in some of the architecture industry AEC industry in general um, are going to lead clients and others to start thinking about, you know, is this um, is this the right place for me to actually bring an architect in, or, or is there a vertically integrated company that I can get to work with who's actually going to manage operations and everything downstream? Um, and it's treated as an ongoing asset rather than something to be built and flipped, or something to be built and operated for a while and then get bought out or whatever. Um, and the uniqueness of which maybe a more hands-on approach that an architect might provide is not seen as something that's as important than the operational issues that we run into and especially as clients are able to much more uh, get much more involved 
and the operations would be much more fine-tuned with how they manage their buildings and how they manage their assets and update and, and fix their assets as they go it's that the the importance of that becomes more and more and more apparent and more and more of an issue i think for architects who aren't moving into that space aren't getting in that conversation um I don't know that I can necessarily name specific kind of market players that I, I, I would look to in that sort of space. And we've all seen some of them that we've all been, um, you know, lauding for years and then completely fall apart, you know, over this over this last year in particular, we've seen some notable names in that sort of case. Um, I think the thing that that really stands out for me, though, is that our I, we've been finding that our relationships with clients are different than they used to be. Um, clients are more interested in a longer term ongoing relationship that will ideally manifest in multiple locations. So if we have a particular client base in San Francisco, they might have a New York location, they might have a Sydney location, they might have a Hong Kong location, and they'd like us to be involved in each of those because it's an ongoing service. It, it turns into much more of an ongoing services type relationship. Now, granted, we have separate contracts for each, but we are still maintaining a consistent relationship with those clients. In fact, like we've gone so far as over the last few years to um, almost kind of shift the hierarchy in terms of how we think about our work and how we even present our work to being less project focused and more client focused. And it's much more about the ongoing services we provide and the relationships that we provide and that we work with them. Now we can't give them everything down the line into construction operations, but what we can give them is both a consistency and approach and someone who understands them who has empathy for the things that they're looking for and the things that they would like um, and are very much engaged in discussions about how they operate and, and what they'd like to see going forward and what their what their customers or what their the employees would like to see. So I, I would say that within our practice, we've definitely been seeing a change in our relationship with our clients to, mu to much more of an ongoing services type model. Uh, we still obviously have all the same one-off projects that any firm would have, but there's an increasingly amount of consistent relationships with some bigger players in the industry that way. The, the, this whole focus on like the client side is, is really fascinating. And I think looking at how the space has developed, especially with these verticalized uh, players, I think it, it, if you just look at the culture of how we consume things today and the tools that we use today, Fundamentally, all the abstract, all the work behind the abstraction of the value we're being provided is to improve the experience, the end user experience, the client experience, yeah. ultimately. So when, when you look at uh, you know, the WeWorks of the world and some of these others, yes, there's a lot of abstraction happening, a lot of work happening to facilitate the delivery of a project. But at the end of the day, the person on the other side of that doesn't care how it was done. They mm -hmm. care very little as to like what the pro the nuts and bolts of how you got there in the same way that like, um, yeah, it's just, it, that's, that's the kind of the, the reality of it. How, I, how would you organize, like when you talk about operations, are you looking at it from that perspective ultimately? Like, is that the dry, the thrust of it at the end of the day is for the client experience? Yeah. I, so I, I think the key thing for me is that, so the client's not interested in how we've done it behind the scenes but they are interested in how they've accomplished it with us. What was that partnership like? What was that journey like? Um, how did we involve them in certain kinds of conversations? And not just in a superficial way where it's like, hey, here's three schemes, pick a scheme, but really digging into the thinking behind it and working with their stakeholders and, and, and ultimately working towards the end goal. And the end goal, sure, our contract says it's gonna be a set of construction documents and maybe a model, but ultimately we're interested in not even just the building, but interested in the experience that they have in that space afterwards. You know, we're designing for human experience of space. So that client experience, um, occasionally I, I kind of throw together, you know, this idea that we're going from it. We're, we're, what our group is interested in is both uh, design experience and client experience. Cause we have, we want to make our employees happy. The people who are designing this work, right? We want them to have a certain amount of joy and freedom and creativity and, and intellectual engagement in the design work that they have. So there's a dimension of the work that we do that we refer to as design experience. What is the overall environment? What is the day-to-day -day feel of how all this actually works? It's not just what tools you turn on, but how does it feel as part of the whole ecosystem? And by extension, aspects of that are then exposed and added onto in the client experience. 
So the client is part of that design, but the client may have other information. So if you're in front of a client who's really, you know, really tightly interested in keeping track of particular metrics associated with their design, well, as you're going through the different schemes, it's really important for you to continually pull that information up in front of them. So if you're working through even, you know, playing around with the parametric model and walking them through different possibilities of schemes, you've got that data up there the whole time because that is a significant metric that will inform their decision process and everything that you show needs to be shown in context of that. Um, when we're presenting to clients who were, uh, you know, really interested in what the kind of overall interior experience of moving from space to space is going to be, well, then there's going to be different ways that we present, whether it's through, you know, VR, AR approaches or um, uh, different types of graphic representations. There's ways at which we need to make sure that they are better understanding their design. So client experience and designer experience are the two number one most important things that we're having to focus on there. Client experience arguably being the biggest one. Doesn't mean we're ignoring our staff, but like it's the client experience, we, we're here to, to serve them and to be able to create something for them and for both the product as well as the experience of designing that product with us is a, is a good one and is an enjoyable one. So we have to be able to answer the questions that they're not always obviously asking. And we have to be able to again empathize what what their you know what are their ultimate drivers and anything that we produce needs to lead them in that direction. So yes, there's the contract and that's going to set up our scope of deliverables, but there's also the plus 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 afterwards of all the other things that sometimes they're not saying, and that really come out through that client engagement experience. So when I'm thinking about from a technology perspective, um, those are the primary things that we have to look at. Sure, it's important to think about data security. Sure, it's important to think about interoperability and all that type of stuff. But arguably, that client experience in the end, if it doesn't lead towards a positive client experience, why are we doing it? As we're as we're starting to dig into the internal uh, side, I'd like to go even deeper and uh, bring up this question of design ops. I'd love to know what the origin story of that term is uh, from your perspective. And um, yeah, just what it means. Like, what what does that mean? How it how does it differ to what might be uh, like a similar kind of embedded technology group in another uh, firm like Woods Bagot? Uh, just yeah, I'd love to hear some elaboration and story on the context of that term. Sure, um, it has obvious reference references to DevOps, which comes out of the kind of um, IT side of this, and it, it comes from a few different places. Uh, I don't remember the exact time the term came up, although I might have either accidentally or luckily at the same time, but indirectly um, had it come up in a conversation with uh, Federico Negro from uh, from Kanoa. He's he's used the term before and I've heard him bring it up and I can't remember whether I heard it from him first or, or if I came up with it separately at the same time. So I'll give him 100 percent of the credit for it. Um, the way that I kind of think about it is that um, again, from my background in computational design, um, I was constantly looking at new ways of exploring design, new, way, new ways of developing a design space to operate when. So if I was thinking about how I embed my design thinking as a, as a project architect or, a, or the whole team engages in a project, what are new ways of us actually collaborating and work with each other or me embedding some of my constraints or design thinking in the tool, the system that I built? Back then, generative components followed by Grasshopper, uh, nowadays, all sorts of stuff. So. Um, that was a, always a really important thing. And as part of that, it was always critiquing how we did our work. Um, we can always find better ways of, of delivering work. So there's a constant process improvement. So as we started to think about this a little bit further, there was always felt like there was a disconnect between that sort of fundamental computational thinking that happened at project level and what happened across an entire firm as the larger ecosystem of tools where you've got Rhino and Revit and everything else in the mix, it felt like there wasn't quite that same sort of mix. It was like, you've got these two camps and then little bits of tenuous connections between them. And then that was about it. So we started thinking much more broadly about the overall ecosystem of tools that fit in that set, how we develop plugins, how we develop interactions between them, how we develop uh, processes, overall workflows that are as fluid as possible because you can develop the most amazing plug in the world, but if it doesn't fit with what the, the designers are needing to, to deliver their work or doesn't fit with their workflows and, and improve upon them, 
that tool's useless. So we really started thinking about the broader context of how people deliver the work and then giving more opportunities for more experimentation. So as we were starting to see individual computational approaches pop up through the practice, you know, here's, for example, a particular workflow about, you know, a curved piece of geometry on a tower that has to be panelized and brought into Revit and turned into adaptive components or Revit families and then scheduled or whatever. Well, we see those sorts of patterns pop up and think, okay, well, we need to have a workflow or a tool that enables that. That's just one of many examples. So that's the first dimension of it is to say, let's scale up what we find in computational approaches to develop a broader ecosystem based upon patterns that we see. And that involves bringing our own software developers in, partnering with other companies and other people, thinking beyond just like single companies to solve all the problems, but much more into a broader ecosystem. But the second thing it started to get to, and this is another thing I see coming out of those involved in design computation, is understanding how those same things can be applied to the operations of a firm, broader just beyond how you put together a deliverables model and drawing set. So starting to think about how this data can surface information about um, staff skills or overall project performance or model health or other kinds of information, these things start to build up. And then we start asking the questions, all right, if I've got this information coming out of my model and I can use it to better or out of my project team and I can use it to better inform how I design future project teams through you know, predictive analytics by then pulling in our finance data, our timesheet information and our skills assessment information. So what this starts to look like then is a very project and design centric um, environment. Again, we're focusing on designer experience and client experience. But that same thinking process now extended into a broader question around how a firm operates and how we can use technology to do this. So then we start thinking, all right, uh, we have a, in our case, we've got a project, a project establishment interface that we've built that pulls data from our finance system that auto generates information in Revit to put together your drawing sets and auto connects it to Rhino models. And then it also surfaces information that when you're working in that model, you can then click on buttons. It knows which project you're in to take screenshots of what you've done, share it with your project teams on our own in-house tool called DI Portal. It's like an in-house Instagram to share it with the rest of the, the you know our 15 studios. And all of these things start linking together in a very clean, simple chain, all centered around the design process, but meant to make it easier and, and remove disconnects with other operational and communications aspects of the company. So that's ultimately where we're going. We're still like early-ish on the journey. The ideas are there and we, we're still, we're till, still making our way in that ultimate direction. Um, but uh, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's an exciting moment because it, uh, it opens up a lot more opportunities to take almost a systems thinking approach to our work that we're not just looking in our little tunnel of design technology, but we're thinking broader about design experience, client experience and operations of the company at the same time. You know, there's a parallel to this in, in technology companies too. And there's been a, an evolution on that front as well about how operations is defined and where how, how it sits organizationally. We're ultimately, what that leads to is a rethinking of the org structure as a whole. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but. Um, one of the things that, that's fascinating to see evolve in tech is this evolution of this uh, role called revenue ops, which is like a very cross-functional role. It really sits on top of like sales, marketing, customer success. And these, this, this, this team is tasked with understanding the entire, let's say, uh, what we call the go-to-market team and, and the life cycle of the customer, right? Or the, uh, in, in our case, in tech, the customer itself. So... Um, one thesis that we have here uh, that we talk about internally here at Monograph is that ultimately this kind of role of design ops will evolve to become more of that kind of equivalent of a revenue ops. Because the, the thing here is that what we haven't yet seen in the, in the industry, I think your team is one of the, uh, I can also think of like KPF as uh, since we interviewed also Alex Wilson, who I think is also a guest right now. Um, and Veronica, KPF, there, there's now this kind of thinking around the uh, how, how this team, which used to be BIM in some cases, now is sort of about the digital practice in some teams, but how it can actually become a much more strategic operational layer across the company. Because the argument being that you have your most technically proficient team members 
who understand how to manipulate data at a pretty advanced level, being placed mostly historically, you know, since BIM has come around, on the let's say like task driven, right? It's or like or billable work or things where like they have to be on a uh, put on a per project basis to generate revenue. When in reality, the leverage that you have from this team is that they can think through data and they can wire systems up together, which has a a huge impact across the organization, not on your product team. So it's it's historically it's been the most under uh, misused, if maybe a better way to frame it, the most misused team in a company. Um, and their thesis here is that ultimately, about five to 10 years from now, that this type of team will start to get more uh, ownership and buy-in from executive leadership when they start to see these proof points come out from your teams and others. But the importance of, of just like having a team like this dedicated to the entire operations of the business. I think um, I... I love that idea. I there's also something that seems quite apt about it because I keep going back to the kind of computational thinking approach or almost this view that um, the people who have done this kind of work and been involved in design technology have often again been either the higher gun to come and fix things, or they've sometimes seen missed opportunities. They know where things are going, so they see a trajectory. They see the opportunities that are out there, and in in and the more we empower them to do that. But then we also make sure that they really understand the overall business of the company, the, the thinking of how this actual industry works, the more they are ideally positioned to not just challenge it, because we don't want a bunch of people who are just like, oh, this is horrible. I don't want this, you know, right. and, and upset. But no, they are incentivized to change it. And we give them the time to change that. We give them that opportunity to do it. I, you know, the my, you know, my title in the company is global leader of technical innovation. That doesn't mean my job is to do the innovation. My job is as a networker to, to connect people up, to connect people up within the organization of interesting ideas and make sure that this person knows this person, this person, and they can connect up and share ideas and do something interesting. My job is also to empower them, to act as a catalyst or a force multiplier between what they've done so I can then take their stuff up through the organization and give them an opportunity to try something. And my job is also to connect them to the outside world, to keep an eye on the trends that are happening out there and keep that stuff going in. So, you know, I, I'm, my job is to be hyper networked and to find exactly those people that you're talking about and try to do what I can to empower them as much as possible. And I do think that there is um, a really interesting both mindset and, and skill set that sits within people who have design technology skills that they are seeing everything out there in the industry. They're seeing the things that are within our, our, our firm and seeing the opportunities to change something and they're wanting to act on it. They just have to be given the support, the career paths to do it. Um, the audience, you know, the, the assisting them and communicating that stuff out there and amazing things will happen. At least I'm confident. Well, we, we've, some of our best changes that have happened in our practice have not come from me. You know, that's not, that's not like, I'm not the person who came up with it. And they've come up from other people there that we want to elevate up and, and help them through the practice. So I, I'm firmly believing that, that there's no such, not, there's no such thing. It's, there shouldn't be a such thing as an innovation group over here that's supposed to fix the practice mm. the moment you name a group that then they are the other they're the ones that oh they're the ones doing innovation i can just do my work i can just do the stuff i'm supposed to do and also they're the ones that as soon as the market starts going down oh we can shed them because we're still just doing our work over here um that group needs to permeate every aspect of the business all the way from design technology to operations to just to you know uh, to sustainability and global impact to all these sorts of topics need to be there so i i agree with you it's like there is a, there's a mindset there's a technical skill and hopefully there's an empowerment to do that and i think that's probably one of the key things that we're seeing happening across practices right now is um, the, a lot of the movement that's happening, one of the, the factors that's happening in the migration of people between different firms has to do with empowerment. Hmm. What are some of your most uh, interesting, I don't know, reference points in the software engineering community, um, like ideas that come from, and I think it's generally interesting to call it like um, design computation where and because like engineer is kind of like a sensitive word in the architecture space, but in technology, uh, the people who build software are called engineers. 
And um, I'm just like, I'd love to know about what, what reference points and what are the, some of the most interesting ideas that you're pulling from software engineering, uh, DevOps being, you know, the foundation of kind of this talk with design ops, but any others and details are, are cool too. Just like the ways that um, software engineers are working and some of the ideas that they're coming up with in terms of how to wrap their head around complex systems. Yeah, I so I, I don't have much of a hang up about terms like engineer or even the fact that software developers use the term architect as well. Some people get really hung up on this, like, oh, you're not licensed. You can't call yourself an architect. I know, honestly, it goes back to Christopher Alexander. I mean, Christopher Alexander, when he wrote Pattern Language, which is a huge influence on the software industry. Um, a lot of the foundation and people reference them all the time in the software industry. Architects are kind of like, oh, yeah, I had that power language book when I was in university. It's on my shelf somewhere. Um, so there's a there's a there's a consistent origin story. You even look at, you know, people like Richard Saul Werman and others who, again, were architects, were heavily influential on data, on analysis, on our, our how we you know think about urban environments and data and software development, all that stuff. A lot of it starts from kind of a, 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 big, a, a very similar starting point. Um, so it's interesting now that we are seeing a lot more companies in design companies are looking towards those models. So to your point, they're looking towards um, how do you organize teams? So like one that came up that we are we're continuing to look at, I would say we haven't properly done it yet, is looking at things like the Spotify squads approach, specifically with how we're organizing possibly our technology teams. We're, we're done a little bit like that, but we're starting to pull ourselves together, especially as we're starting to think about the concept of guilds, people who have some consistent skills and interest areas is sharing across the groups. We argue we have three software development teams in our company that are under three different orgs of the company, but those groups are starting to share a lot more in terms of their skills, um, but each is in charge of their own product line. Um, so we, we've kind of found ourselves in that direction. We've been learning from that. The other one is just the overall agile software development process. Um, I run, you know, I, I run our team in, um, in, uh, in agile processes. So we've got a mixture depending on the project between uh, Kanban and Scrum. Uh, we have some projects that are doing proper sprints. We go through when we do um, our regular showcases and retrospectives. We go through, we set out our user stories. We kind of organize our sprints. We kind of manage the sprints through. And I have a sprint manager working on some of those projects through. And we have other groups that are uh, a little bit less directed, but where the Kanban approach works really well, especially from a transparency perspective of who's working on what and how are we getting down the line towards meeting our ultimate goals in the roadmap. Um, and you know we have regular kind of catch-ups then with the team using that Kanban board. Um, so some of that's learned from both agile and lean. You know the the some of the concepts around lean manufacturing, like the approach around continuous learning, uh, around things like the Gemba walk of actually getting in with the project teams and understanding what they're doing on the floor in order to better understand their processes. So we've been trying to pick up more of that within our team itself. Now. I wouldn't say necessarily that has extended out as much to the wider practice, but there is a lot more conversation about that. Some of our, you know, our partner company and consulting called Erico has been spending more time thinking at those sort of spaces and how they operate. But even within some of the architectural teams, we've been having conversations about organizing around kind of an overall agile approach using tools like, you know, Jira and such like that for those teams to operate in. And one of the main reasons why we've been looking to do that is to address some of the operational concerns that we seem to have a lot of companies seem to do a relatively good job of setting up the overall operational approach and project delivery approach down to like a certain level at what it hits project manager level this is what a project manager is supposed to be delivering we run design reviews at this sort of frequency um you know there's stakeholder engagements at these points and we have certain kind of internal processes below that point it's kind of a no man's land in a lot of architectural practices where you have task lists as everywhere from non-existent to post-it notes to Excel spreadsheets to email threads, right? So what we've been really thinking about a lot is how we can really ease the overall experience of that type of stuff of tracking our deliverables and helping them working to take on some of the things that come out of, uh, of agile software development, even all the way down to thinking are you know a series of uh, interim deadlines? Can they be aligned with overall sprint approaches? Are there things that we can take from that that are beneficial from a um, from an overall approach where we're not like backloading a whole bunch of tasks 
in to happen during the last three days before a deadline. Everybody's working late nights, but then we can have a lot of transparency of the overall flow and that the cadence in which the team is actually delivering. Um, there's a lot of ideas that happen in there, but I, I can't say that we've necessarily done them yet. We're just at the kind of early stages of exploring uh, what those opportunities are. So, uh, at that level, at the kind of like uh, project level, what are the other opportunities maybe so you mentioned cadences which is uh a term near and dear for us here too and, and with uh, other previous guests that we've had on before um where they like they look at operational cadences uh, i think of uh, uh shane balcom at at rossman architecture who talks a lot about that about setting up like routine check-ins on a quarterly week uh, you know all the way down to like a weekly basis and this idea specifically which i think is important which is like the idea of a one-on-one -on -one with team members which is a managerial tool Right, but it's mm -hmm. a very highly effective tool. What, how, how has that evolved over? I mean, are there still opportunities to to change the way that um, the the idea of mentorship kind of lines itself up with one on ones? But you talked a little bit about like finding those people within the organization and bringing them up. You might not have awareness through every single because Woods Packet is really huge. What other systems are there in place that help to? provide those kind of feedback loops on a regular basis on, you know, other cadences, I guess, from a managerial perspective. Um, so there's a few things. I mean, one, I've been working, so there's a few things I've been doing within our team. Um, some of this actually comes up a little bit of, came out of like John Doerr's Measure What Matters and the OKR approach. And there's a specifically a thing that I found interesting from, I think it's from this book um, uh, called CFRs, which is, basically trying to break down the performance review process and as well as the overall engagement with staff process into a different kind of conversation. Um, and some of this also comes out of, um, there's, a, there's a few different books that have talked about, I think the culture code references a bit of this by Daniel Coyle. There's a few other ones and I'm mixing up which book all these ideas come from because I'm trying to synthesize them into one. But the idea with this is that um, we, you know, making yourselves available to someone else to, uh, on a regular basis. So I set up, for example, every member of my team, we have at least a half hour chat once a month that's separate from projects to, for them to talk about anything that they want. Um, you know, the, the, the idea with it is that there are much broader things that could be discussed beyond just the tasks that they're working on. So it allows me to get to know them better, to have more empathy for the things that they're doing, for them to get to know be, me better in some way. And I'm starting to set those up also with other people that don't directly report to me, but others whose careers that I'm trying to help foster um, in the company is to connect those up on a regular basis. Um, but I can't talk to everybody. You know, we're over 800, 900 people. So that's really difficult to do. So what are some of the other ways? And the other ways that we're doing is we've built up an internal design computation community that's um, through um, essentially organized in Microsoft Teams, um, but it is also, we have regular catch ups and we're gonna start building up these clusters around various topics. And again, to get groups of people together around topics like automation and coding and analysis and you know um, uh, 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 interoperability or whatever sort of topics we wanna get into, um, so I can kind of get an insight into the kind of overall conversations of the people that are there. So we're spread at 15 offices around the globe um, and nobody's traveling right now. So I can't go studio to studio to meet people and take them out to coffee. So I get to know them through there and through teams. I also find that it, it is quite interesting because usually in those scenarios, so all those ones I just mentioned, I get to know the people that are maybe more confident in their skills um, and are a bit more vocal and outward. I'm not saying they're extroverts, we're all pretty much introverts, uh, but it's like they at least have a little bit more confidence. But there are some amazing people, both in our practice and I'm sure elsewhere, that are that don't have quite the confidence or a bit more quiet, but their skills are amazing. You really want to get to know them. You want to help them out. You want to help support their careers. So we've also been finding that some of our analytics in the back end have been surfacing bits of this. So for example, when we start seeing a significant amount of use of certain grasshopper plugins from people that we've never met before. It's like, oh, here's somebody. I should maybe reach out to them and figure out, you know, find out what they're doing. We'd like to learn a little bit more. Would you like to learn something? Um, those sorts of things have been popping up where we find that there's occasionally people that come out of the woodwork that we weren't aware of before, simply because we're trying to use these analytics to help drive skills and learning and development across the company. And that's allowing certain amounts of things to pop up at that point. Um, some of it also comes out just through 
you know, various internal lectures and knowledge sharing sessions where people will pop up that we haven't met before. Um, but it, it's, I, I would say, as I've been looking at my career over the last 10 years at Woods Baggett, um, it is the one area that when I first started here, I very much underestimated um, as to the importance of it and didn't invest near as much time as I should have. Uh, over the last probably three to five years, it has been increasingly a bigger focus of my time. And I would say more of my time is spent doing that now than any other single one topic, because um, it's more important for me to get to know the people, to help them do their jobs, help them with their careers, help connect them up with people and to get inside their heads in some cases and help get that stuff out through the company to, to share out across our global studio. It's more important for me to do that that it is for me to engage in a project myself and do actual work on that thing itself. Uh, because um, that sort of emergent culture of networking is self-perpetuating. It will continue to, to build on itself and help build up in the company. The other thing that's amazing about that um, is, I think oftentimes people look at productivity solely as uh, maybe a function of skill set expertise and whatnot and they they discount uh the mental like the, the state of the person mentally or like psychologically right and they discount the fact that like people might be going through shit at the end of the day or they they don't or they don't get that feedback necessary to improve um or whatnot right and i think what what you know it's been what you're recognizing too and it's becoming more apparent um is the importance of touching base with people on a regular cadence has a huge impact on likely performance, engagement, and all these other things that we, and, and their career ultimately, right? The yeah. fact that like most firms wait for, uh, let's say for those feedback, the, the traditional feedback loop in, in, a, in an office is like maybe six months, more likely a year to get an yeah. annual 360 if that review, right? But what you're suggesting is actually like having those re that frequent cadence of, of uh, just meeting aside from the work, what you're working on, just about the person has a much more impactful, right? I mean, it's almost like their, their engagement is probably much more exponential versus also, and you can also get the catch stuff beforehand. Which... Yeah, I, we're, it's the people we work with is incredibly important. The context of which you work in the people that, you know, you yourself could be absolutely amazing, but you know, you're going to be work if you're working with the team that's bringing you down mentally in terms of your experience, it's going to be a problem for you the whole time. I, um, I mean, there's lots of places where the, that my thinking on this has progressed, but you know, there, it was kind of simply put together in, and I referenced this before in Daniel Coyle's uh, Culture Code, he mentions three kind of things that help build those environments. And this is what helps build people's experience and positivity and view uh, in their work, but also helps especially build innovation teams and or not teams, but communities or cultures in general. Uh, first one is building safety. The, um, and by connecting into those people one-on-one, -on -one, it's a private conversation. It's I'm not bringing anything to the conversation in terms of agenda. It's their agenda. They could talk about anything they want from um, I'm exhausted. I need some time off. Can you help me with some time management or can I'm having an issue with such and such to um, let's talk about my roadmap for the project. I don't quite understand. And even I've you know, I, I did a, a, a 30 minute JIRA tutorial for a new team member at one point during the session because that's what they wanted to know. I am here for them. My job is to help them be successful. That's it. I am I'm very much there to support them. So you you start by building safety. So this is an open conversation. You can say anything you want. Um, this is uh, there's nothing wrong. You, know, you can't say anything wrong. The second part would be shared shared vulnerability. They need to know I'm a human being. They need to know that I make mistakes. Um, and that I'm still don't have all the answers and I need to explore things as well. And I'm here to help them. But in all honesty, I'm working to help them. Um, the third part, which is the one that I think people do catch, uh, but they miss the first two. It's so it, it kind of misses the point is establishing purpose. We all need to have some sort of reason why we are here. Um, you need to have a reason for why you are contributing as an individual to that particular project. If you start thinking that your purpose needs to move beyond a project to be in a mar you wanting to make a broader impact across a practice, which is absolutely something that I did in a previous firm. And part of the reason why I left the firm is I lost the opportunity for that purpose. Um, then, well, I want to know that and I want to help you with that. And so 
establishing a purpose and an alignment between that purpose and what we're looking for in the company can be really helpful that way. So those are um, those are really, I guess, important topics to, to make sure that you are available for and conversations you're available for. When you can do that one on one with a person and you can also do that within a community, again, where you've got a group of people together who are bringing up topics where no topic is a bad idea. It's all meant to riff and have ideas on. I mean, I, I come from a background of improvisational music. I played jazz and combos and big bands growing up. And it's like, there was no bad idea. Everybody was throwing stuff into the mix and it was all, let's do this together and let's experiment together. And that was where the energy and vitality came from. When you can do that same stuff, build a safe environment, you share your vulnerability, you open yourself up to that group, but you establish a purpose. This is the direction we're going. We need to move this way as a community. And you're all helping there to define that you're gonna have tremendous success both one-on-one -on -one with a person and ideally with a larger community. And we have a question from the audience from Marjan sure. Pearson, a previous guest of Best Practice and also at Section Cut. In an interview with Randy Deutsch uh, that we did uh, recently, George asked Randy whether super users were moving into the C-suite. One of the challenges was whether tech leaders like Shane, like yourself, would be involved at a enterprise level uh, with a strategy at a, and at a fiduciary level that's focused on the business of the enterprise, uh, say for example, like with Woods Bagot. It appears that, it appears that you're at that level. Um, the question is whether you've had the uh, opportunity to participate at the board level strategy at Woods Bagot uh, with meetings about the firm and not only just the technical aspects of the practice. Um, yes and no. So, uh, for example, we so we have two boards um, within the company, two kind of group. Our, our, our structure is particular. I mean, we run as a global practice, so I'm a shareholder in the company um, and that company is a global company. So I have equal input on any studio in the company, even though I'm here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I report to our global executive. I work directly under our COO. Um, um, so she's, I report to her directly on a very regular basis, like once a week I'm, I'm on calls with her and also to our CEO. Um, but I also sit on a global executive, which is um, handling the sort of day-to-day -day larger operations of the company. Um, when it comes to the bigger strategic level decisions, I'm brought in obviously for technology related conversations, but I'll give you an example, one that I was, uh, was, was very much part of is sitting in our strategy board in conversations about skills development, about learning culture in the company. So we talked about some of that a little bit before, um, but there was a, um, the question was asked, you know, we know, we know roughly where we are now. We know we need to get somewhere different five to 10 years from now. Our, our, the, our practice is changing. What are the various things that we can do to get us there? Well, technology is one, sure, but how do we bring people along to the journey? How do we have them as be part of that process? So it turned into a whole conversation about a trying to develop a continuous learning culture, really focusing on investments in staff skills, um, not just to teach them like very individual things, like this is how you do this thing in Revit versus whatever, but to actually build a much more learning mindset so that we actually um, set up this more perpetual machine of we're going to keep moving forward. It's not like, oh, every two years we go, oh, shoot, we need to hurry up and catch people up on the latest versions of these tools. No, let's set up this engine to keep renewing itself as we go. So I was heavily involved in those conversations that resulted in a global capability skills assessment across the company. We're setting up an entire like learning approach to go along with this. Um, it's turned into a broader conversation about how does the data and information about that uh, about that help inform us then it, uh, helping people in their career paths in their professional development? Do we bring you know it in their yearly performance reviews or maybe their monthly you know CFRs? Do we bring that up and make sure that we are helping foster them along in that journey? Um, does this give us an opportunity, for example, to highlight people who say they want to learn something or want to try a new sector out that when we're resourcing a project, we look for people who are hungry to learn something new We say, let's bring them on that project. So it, it, I, was, I say yes and no, because yes, it has helped me to move into a few spaces that are one or two steps removed specifically from what it might have been the tight definition of design and technology in the company design technology and technology in general in the company no in that there are some broader discussions that i'm not as involved in um 
but I do get pulled in from time to time for that. There are, you know, there are other um, examples of people in similar positions to mine. I think of people like Alex Pollock, um, who's a, a CTO, and uh, you know Corey Brueger and a few others who are also a CTO who are involved in the same kinds of positions. I do definitely find that per Randy's point and what was brought up by the person who asked the question, there are more people in positions like mine who are fitting into the strategic positions and are helping set vision for the company and are involved in those conversations about where the company is going um, in the years forward. Shane, as you interface with manufacturing, like so on one end, you have this um, software engineering kind of interface between that and architecture with computational design. But when projects come into the real world, um, you know, a conversation that's been going on for so long is like, when will construction become manufacturing? And when you do see, um, when, when it does kind of feed into manufacturing a bit with the most advanced work that you're doing in the most advanced fabrication that you're doing, what kind of ideas are you seeing in contemporary manufacturing that are most interesting to you and um, inspire you to either tap into and how they work or try to bring in those ideas and how you uh, run uh, the practice at Woods Bagot? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I, we've had just a mix of effort in different studios in our company and, and different projects to get into the whole industrialized construction conversation. Um, some of that is centered around singular projects where we've developed a relationship with a fabricator and have just tried to had a very clean workflow and engagement. So we, you know, we learn from their constraints and their opportunities and what they're building to bring that stuff forward. We've also gone after some partnerships with some companies who are um, not quite vertically integrated, but but have a few steps along that chain. Um, and are very specifically looking at products. We've advised them on some of their products and how it could be used. Um, it hasn't really turned, I guess, into a more formal ongoing engagement. So it's something that I think we're still relatively new to. Um, I, I think the thing for me that I am, I'm hoping we're going to get out of this as we go forward, and this is something that's increasingly becoming important to us, is thinking about um, the opportunities for uh, the overall kind of industrialized construction approach and the kind of new mo modes of manufacturing, uh, specifically to cut down on waste um, and overall carbon footprint of our construction processes. And, you know, the, I think there's tremendous opportunities for us to learn from what they're doing to help inform our design process so it's as synthesized as possible. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I would say it's not an area that we have invested as much energy on over the last year or two. Um, there are definitely other firms that have jumped into it to a much higher degree, um, but it is something that we are looking at a lot more of and thinking about how we can both inform the products that they're creating to make sure that there's a wider array of uses, not specifically just on our projects, but in architecture in general, um, and what what the kind of use cases are, but also from us being informed about how their products can work to then build that into our models as much as possible. Um, how we can make sure that 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 what we are providing in terms of our documentation, our specifications, our drawings, our schedules, and everything, um, very directly inform what their manufacturing process is. What would you say? You know, you design computation has been going on it's been going on for a little while a yeah. while enough to say that there are some technologies that have really become stable um where you, even but still in the industry you might have people who are almost like two generations behind on stable technology at least at the higher scale like the scale that woods bag it's at right now what what is that technology that's pretty much become table stakes um, in the past three years or four years that may have seemed like very disruptive about 10 years ago. Um, I, what, one, in, one in general, I would say just standard Revit based delivery is one it's, um, it's become very it, much more of like a commodity driven thing. Everybody can pretty much do it. Um, the speed at which you can automate aspects of the delivery process or put together your drawing sets that way. Um, has become much more standard. The probably the one that that moved pretty quickly um, that I've appreciated has a lot to do with visualization as well. 
So, you know, at the ease at which people are bringing stuff into um, Enscape and Twin Motion and Unreal and now Omniverse and all this sorts of stuff that's out there and the amount of competition that's happening in the market has made it much easier for people to be jumping into very quick visualization to the effect that, you know, some of these are, are basically just becoming higher quality viewports while you're designing. And to be able to have those really high end kind of visualizations built into the design process. I mean, my my biggest interest in terms of visualization has to do with what we what our project teams are doing on a regular basis. We have an amazing set of like full time visualizers that do just these incredible, you know, um, incredible work. Um, and they have an, an amazing amount of artistry to the work that they do. But I think the the ease at which it has become very easy for project teams to put together very high in visualization, uh, sorry, visuals for our clients to look at, and especially just to walk them through that has become um, a pretty quick change. Shane, are you recruiting? <laughs> always, always, yeah. I, I would say that uh, I'm sure there are, there's particular positions that we're hiring for uh, coming up soon. So keep an eye out. I'll post them on Twitter in various places. But, you know, the whole company in general, whether it's working directly for me or working for any of our studios, we're looking for people with the mindsets that I was talking about here. And it, listen, I'll say we're not perfect yet. All the things I talked about sounds like everything's perfect and amazing. We have our mistakes, just like anybody else's. We're all learning. We're all trying to, to work on this. We want contributions from from people who are engaged and interested in helping us make this journey. So sure, we're absolutely hiring. All right, so I'm going to uh, transition over to the, uh, the final question that we'd like to ask all of our guests here. Um, if you've listened to some of our previous interviews, you might have already, you might already know what it is. Um, essentially, um, what is the, the kindest or nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? And it can be, we run the gamut here on like the type of answer we get. So um, I, was, I was thinking about this because you sent me the question in advance and I, I, there's so many different versions of this um, that I can think of. I've been really lucky with some great people that I've, I've worked with and I've lived with and, and grown and learned with. One of the ones that really stands out for me and that still kind of nourishes me to this day has to do with music and my background in music. And I, I, I alluded to this a bit ago. When I was in high school, I played in high school jazz bands. And um, when I was in those groups, a lot of it was just me learning how to interact with others, but it's continuous improvisation. You're constantly, you know, you'll have a, sometimes you have the music written out, sometimes you just have chord changes and you're making your way through it and you have to interact with people. But the specific instance that I, I felt like was really a kind moment happened with a group of people, a small group that I was working with, a rhythm section and a few horns. And we were, we were gonna be playing this small concert at some outside park at some point come up soon. This was like an individual group that we had. And we wanted to arrange some new songs. And I said, I'd like to try one. So I tried one and I put together some music for it. I, I you know, wrote out some of the parts, I was working with it. And as I was going through it, working with the group, each of them were each informing me on how what I could have done might be, how they could take better advantage of it as a creative opportunity on their particular instrument how they could contribute a little bit to it, but allowed me the whole time the freedom to make the decision, the freedom to interact with them, to develop this idea and to develop this kind of collective thing where really they were all contributing, but I was still setting the direction the overall approach. And the fact that I was completely new to this, I was completely exposed. It scared the hell out of me to try to do something like this but they were constantly encouraging and supportive and wanting to take part in it because they were excited of the idea of seeing what I would come up with. That was amazing. Uh, and that happened in high school. You can't imagine that like typically those sort of things would people be so kind in high school like that, but it was an amazing experience for me. And it really set the overall kind of trajectory in my brain about how, what are those opportunities for how people work with each other? Um, and it's, I still think about it. like. I, I don't have the sheet music anymore. I don't really remember the name of the song, but I remember the experience so well. Those little moments of back and forth of, hey, let's try this. What do you think about this? Oh, this is what this would sound like. I like what you did here. Like those sort of interactions, that sort of creative collaboration, I want it with everything. I want it with any way that I work with people. Uh, that's such a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Shane. Um, well, we're, we're almost at the end. The last thing I'll leave everyone with is just a little bit, a quick blurb of Monograph and what we're, what we're about. Um, architects are calling Monograph a game changer. 
principals, operations leaders, and office admins are using Monograph to run operations and manage the back office. It's designed for architects by architects. About half of our team has some sort of relationship with architecture or landscape architecture even. Um, and it's specific for small to medium-sized firms. Monograph customers are reducing their Monday morning staffing meetings by 5X. I mean, they're going from several hours on a weekend sometimes where they, they uh, all the way to just having a, a real-time sync with their team. Um, all the way to looking out six months out at their billings to plan when they need to hire and when to bring on new projects. Try it out for yourself. Uh, you can start a free trial today at monograph.com or book a one-on-one -on -one demo with one of our excellent experts. Um, we'll add a link to the chat there. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. We got to have you come back uh, to dive more deep and maybe a year from now, or maybe at Section Cutter or a uh, coming event uh, to kind of unpack some of the uh, it may be more detail, some of the operational uh, uh, things you've learned uh, over the years. And oh, as always, thanks to everybody that joined us and to Chris Morgan, my uh, collaborator here. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Thanks, everybody. We just dropped a, uh, a link to follow Shane on Twitter, uh, where you can continue the conversation. Everybody, as always, very much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.